So now that we talked a little bit about mathematical operators, what I want to do is introduce you to the concept of a commutator. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take two operators, two mathematical operators, and I'm going to define this new function as the commutator of A with B. And what that means is that I'm going to grab the product of A and B, and I'm going to subtract B times A. And this definition is going to allow us to say that operators A and B do not commute if this is not equal to zero. So if the difference between these two products is non-zero, we conclude definitely that A and B are non-commutative operators, so they do not commute. This is a really important thing in quantum mechanics because it arises when we use operators for solving the Schrodinger equation. And I will in fact show you how to use this when we get to the harmonic oscillator problem a lot later on. But for now, I'm going to define some of the properties of a commutator. So first of all, I want to uh, introduce you <coughs> to some of the operators that we deal with in quantum mechanics. The first one of which is the position operator. So the position operator is quite simple. It basically takes a coordinate. So say we have a particular system. Let's say we have a vector and then this is simply taking a coordinate or a variable associated with the coordinate and it's multiplying that by whatever function. So an example of that would be just the operator for x, which is in fact the coordinate x. So if I were to apply this operator to some function, let's say of x squared, then what we're essentially going to do is we're going to multiply this x squared by x. So we're going to have x times x squared, and this is going to result in x3. So x to the power of 3. That's all it does. The position operator, all it does is it multiplies the function by a coordinate. And we can generalize that to higher dimensions. We're simply going to multiply the function by its coordinate. That's it. That's all it does. The second operator I'm going to introduce is the momentum operator. Now this one is a little bit more elaborate because now we have this imaginary unit here minus i times the Planck constant or the reduced Planck constant which is in fact just the Planck constant over 2 pi. So this is actually I wrote it the wrong way. This is the reduced Planck constant and is equal to the Planck constant over 2 pi. This is the general symbol that we use in quantum mechanics. And we're going to multiply this by the del operator, which is just this little nabla. And as we recall from vector calculus, nabla is simply a gradient operator. So basically it just takes the, the first partial derivative. So this would be this. So it's a vector quantity. And that's essentially all it is. So it is taking some, say, some function. If we apply it to some function, then all it is doing is it is multiplying that function, which is in general a scalar function. And it is taking the gradient of that function times this constant. So just to show you an example, let's apply the momentum operator, but let's apply just the x coordinate of it. So we're going to have, let's define it as i Planck constant reduced d over dx. So this would be the one dimensional version. So we just have this d over dx here. And now what we're going to do is we're going to multiply this by some function. So let's apply the momentum operator to some function. Let's say x squared again, just for simplicity. So if we apply if we apply the operator to that, then all we're doing is we're doing this operation here. And we know that this is going to be minus 2i Planck constant x. That's it. That would give us the momentum associated with this function 
in some way this is just a very generic point of view we'll see that there are ways in which we can associate this with a uh, with a particular physical quantity and finally I'm gonna talk about the Hamiltonian operator so the Hamiltonian operator is generally defined in many different ways and you will see why it is defined in different ways but in essence it is simply the sum of the kinetic and potential energies of a system so basically what that means is that if we take the Hamiltonian operator multiplied by a wave function the eigenvalues are going to be energies so the energy levels of that wave function so basically this term here corresponds to the kinetic energy and this term here corresponds to the potential energy and so the energies that we calculate from the eigenvalues are the total energies of the system that's pretty straightforward and here we have Nabla square which is the Laplacian and this is simply the sum of the uh, second partial derivatives so we have something like this and the reason this is very generic is because our potential function even though the kinetic energy always has this term the potential energy is an arbitrary function and it can be a function of both space and time so there are infinite possibilities as to what this potential function can be so that's a really important thing because really to solve any problem involving the Schrodinger equation we need to define a potential and you will see that for most cases it is not possible to obtain an exact solution for those even for simple potentials so that's a really important thing that we need to point out another important aspect of these three operators that we just talked about is that because they correspond to physical observable quantities they are all Hermitian so remember a Hermitian operator is one that has the property that it is equal to its own adjoint which is just a transpose complex conjugate of that and you might say well how about the momentum operator I mean if you took the complex conjugate of that then would you would you actually get the same result because here we have an imaginary unit attached to it so if we take the complex conjugate this becomes positive so we no longer have an equality but that's not precisely how we would calculate that because if we have an operator in this case a differential operator then what we need to do is we need to use the following kind of operation so in essence what we want to prove is that this is equal to that so we need to actually apply the operator to a wave function we need to apply it to a wave function to actually prove that I won't prove to you that the momentum operator is her mission in this video I will do it in a video later on but because these operators correspond to physical quantities that we can measure they're all her mission and that's just an inherent property of these operators otherwise we wouldn't have them because there's no point of having an operator that does not relate to something that we can measure uh, in real life so now that we have defined that I want to show you an example of how you would go about finding the commutator of two functions so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to show you that the commutator of the position operator with the momentum operator in one dimension and this extends to three dimensions as well is non-zero we're going to prove that so basically we know that x hat and p hat this is going to be equal to x hat times p hat minus p hat times x hat and I'm gonna prove to you that this is not equal to zero so they do not commute now obviously we're dealing with operators here so it doesn't make sense to just have operators floating around by themselves if we want to truly get an expression we need to multiply this by some function so the operators need to operate on some function so what we're going to do and this is the standard procedure for finding the commutation relationship between two operators is we're going to let this act on some arbitrary function x such that we have the following xp f of x plus actually that should be minus p hat x hat f of x <coughs> and now if we expand this so we know that this is just going to be x 
the momentum operator is going to be minus i h bar and now it's going to be the first derivative so df over dx the second element of this equation is going to be minus minus i h bar of d over dx but now notice the order in which this occurs p is now acting on x times f of x so let's first of all let's use a grouping here let's pair these two let this operate on f first and let p operate on the on the result that comes out of that so x times f well we know the x operator is just x so that's just going to be x times f so now we're essentially going to take the derivative with respect to this function so we're going to use the product rule so let me just come here we're going to use the product rule and what's going to happen now is actually I'm not going to write it down like this this is just going to be the following and this is going to give us the following so now we're going to have well this is just going to be minus i h bar x times df over dx now the second term that's going to be plus so we're going to have plus i h bar now we're going to expand this out so the first one is going to act on x so that's going to be 1 times f of x and then the second one is going to be d over dx acting on f so we're going to have plus x d of f over dx now if we expand this out we notice that this times that is the same as that so we can pretty much just cancel these two out and we're left with the following so this is a really important result because it means that we have obtained we have obtained the commutate oh the commutator of x and p and it turns out to be i h bar because essentially what we do is we cancel out the f of x on both sides we divide by f of x in both sides and this is what results from that so you notice that this is not zero it's actually just a constant value and it is imaginary it is a complex number and this is what results from this commutate Com, uh, commutation relationship so hopefully that gives you an idea of what this whole commutability um, of operators is all about and we're going to continue this talk in the next video when we actually apply operators to some other applications